Welcome back to the channel, I'm Semi Sherpa, your guide through the intricate landscape of semiconductor technologies. We're back with our photolithography series, now packed with even more comprehensive and varied information. This is episode 2, and by following along, you'll gain the knowledge you need to participate in specialized discussions, whether it's in academia, professional settings, or just casual conversations with experts in the field. This series is designed for everyone, from seasoned engineers to curious students and industry newcomers. Today's episode zeroes in on the imaging process. We'll cover the basics of Abbe's imaging theory and the Rayleigh equation, delve into resolution enhancement technologies, and take a closer look at ASML's lithography tools. Stay tuned for future episodes that will focus on topics like UV and multi-patterning technology. In this episode, we'll start with a quick history of lithography, move on to the theory behind image formation, and then explore techniques for enhancing resolution. We'll also give you a detailed rundown of ASML's 2050i equipment. So, get ready for a deep dive into the fascinating world of the imaging process. Are you set to embark on this educational journey? Let's get started. The invention of the integrated circuit in 1958 marked a turning point in technological advancements. Following this, lithography became the primary method for replicating intricate patterns from a mask onto a wafer. Today, optical lithography, often referred to as photolithography, stands as the dominant technology in IC fabrication. It employs visible, UV, deep UV and EUV radiation, ranging from 436 to 13.5 nanometers, to transfer these patterns. Over the decades, photolithography has undergone numerous refinements and transformations. In this episode, we'll delve into evolution of this technology to emerge in ARF lithography in detail, reserving EUV for a dedicated episode. The foundational technique in this journey is contact printing. The principle was simple, replicate the mass pattern by placing it in direct contact with the wafer. While this method eliminated the need for lenses and allowed expansive field sizes, achieving flawless contact was a formidable challenge. Even when such contact was realized, it was undesirable for three reasons. Firstly, if there are slight flaws or imperfections on the mask or wafer, they can cause poor contact. This leads to interference, creating uneven light patterns on the wafer. Secondly, after the mask and wafer have been in contact, separating them without issues can be tricky. There's a risk of them sticking together or not separating cleanly. Lastly, when the mask and wafer are in direct contact, there's always a chance of physical damage. This could be due to particles trapped between them, pressure applied during the process, or even the act of separation itself. Over time, these damages can accumulate, affecting the quality and lifespan of both the mask and wafer. To address these issues, transitioning from the 1960s to 1975s, the industry began to favor proximity printing as a remedy to the pitfalls of contact printing. Here, the mask and wafer were maintained at a deliberate distance of 20 to 100 microns, achieving resolutions of 3 to 5 microns. This method effectively addressed the direct contact issues but introduced a compromise in resolution. To push the boundaries of resolution, especially targeting the 2 to 3 micron range, the proximity gap was minimized to 20 microns, and the resist thickness was reduced to about 1 micron. However, these modifications introduced new challenges. The diminished distances heightened the risk of mask contamination. To combat this, the industry transitioned to chrome masks, which, despite being more durable, required cleaning after approximately every 100 exposures due to wear and contamination. With the relentless pursuit of even tinier feature sizes, specifically below 2 microns, projection printing emerged as the next evolutionary step. Introduced around 1973, this technique utilized a 1 to 1 optical system to project the mask's image onto the wafer. The standout advantage was the considerable distance between the mask and wafer, eliminating the need for direct contact. This not only prolonged the mask's lifespan but also drastically reduced defect density. In these systems, the mask to wafer distance was typically around 80 cm. This significant distance, combined with the introduction of protective pellicles on the mask, ensured the safety and longevity of both components, marking a significant leap in productivity and efficiency. 
A pivotal aspect of projection printing is its relationship with wavelength in the context of resolution enhancement. Unlike proximity printing, where resolution improvement is tied to the square root of the wavelength, projection printing exhibits a linear relationship. This means that as the wavelength is reduced, the enhancement in resolution with projection printing is substantially more pronounced. In the early days of optical lithography, projection systems were designed to image the entire wafer exposure without any demagnification. However, as integrated circuits evolved and the minimum feature size reached 1 micron, the field size of these full wafer systems expanded alongside the wafer size, growing from 50 to 125 millimeters in diameter. As wafer sizes continued to increase, projection printing faced a significant limitation, it couldn't image all the features onto a wafer at once. This limitation was further exacerbated by the continuous growth in wafer size and the simultaneous reduction of feature dimensions. Doing full wafer prints without shrinking the image became harder because of challenges with controlling the pattern sizes on the mask and ensuring accurate pattern placement. By the late 1970s, the industry witnessed the introduction of reduction projection printing as a means to mitigate these issues. Reduction emerged as a solution to the pressing need for resolving smaller features, ensuring tight feature size control, and maintaining overlay accuracy. This shift marked a significant departure from the early projection systems, which were designed to image the full wafer exposure without any demagnification. Zeiss pioneered this change by introducing the first optical reduction system, which utilized a 10x demagnification. Fast forward to today, and modern systems predominantly use a reduction factor of 4x. This shift to reduction systems has proven beneficial in multiple ways. As shown in the examples in the tables, the root sum square of the CD error for 1x system stands at 15.75%, whereas for 4x systems, it's reduced to 12.9%. Now, when we consider more challenging scenarios, such as when the mask error enhancement factor, MEF, is at 4, the impact of the reduction becomes even more evident. In these situations, any error on the mask gets amplified, making it 4 times larger on the wafer. Furthermore, the overlay error of a 1x system can be a staggering 76% more than its 4x counterpart. These statistics underscore the advantages of a reduction system, especially from the perspective of CD and overlay control. However, it's worth noting that while a high reduction ratio is desirable for CD and overlay control, it comes with its own set of challenges. A greater reduction ratio necessitates the use of a larger mask. Additionally, to maintain the same imaging size on the wafer, there's a need for extended and faster scanning. Implementing these requirements in real-world systems can come with a hefty price tag. Initially, the industry relied on a reduction projection printing technique known as step-and-repeat photolithography, or more commonly, the stepper. This method operates similarly to a camera, capturing an image from the reticle and imprinting it onto the wafer. However, unlike a traditional camera, the stepper's lens has to be considerably larger due to the expansive area of the reticle that it needs to capture. This large lens size presents challenges, especially as it becomes more susceptible to lens aberrations. Moreover, because the stepper imprints the image in one go, there's limited flexibility in adjusting focus or overlay corrections in the Y direction. The stepper's primary function is to expose a single shot onto the wafer. The process involves keeping both the mask and lens stationary, while the wafer is moved to different positions for each exposure. Steppers were designed with various optics, including 1 to 1 and reduction optics like 10x, 5x, and the more modern 4x. Typically, the lens area for a stepper measures around 22 by 22 square millimeter. However, due to lens aberrations and manufacturing challenges, the field size is often limited. This limitation is particularly pronounced at the corners, where the image quality can degrade. Despite these challenges, the stepper's step-and-repeat process was a game-changer. As wafer sizes grew and feature sizes shrank, the projection system's image field size became a limiting factor. The step-and-repeat feature was introduced to address this, allowing for the exposure of smaller areas, typically between 1 and 2 square centimeters, and then repeating this pattern across the larger wafer. This technique not only improved resolution but also enhanced alignment accuracy compared to full wafer printing. Unlike the stepper, which imprints the reticle image onto the wafer in a single shot, the scanner operates differently. 
It functions similarly to a copier, where only a portion of the wafer is exposed to the reticle's image at a time. This is done by moving both the mask and the wafer in synchronized motions, allowing for a continuous scanning process. The scanner's design allows for a smaller lens size compared to the stepper. This is because the area of the reticle exposed to light is reduced, which in turn reduces the lens size. A smaller lens size has its advantages. It's less susceptible to aberrations, which means that the numerical aperture or inner can be increased. A higher inner translates to better resolution, which is crucial for the intricate designs in semiconductor manufacturing. Optical lenses often face issues with reproducibility of aberrations. However, scanners utilize only a portion of the lens corresponding to the slit field. By rotating the lens and selecting the position with the least aberration, scanners have a hidden trick to achieve an in a gain. The step and scan method offers several advantages. One of the most significant benefits is the ability to extend the field size in one direction without placing additional demands on the imaging lens. This is crucial as chip sizes increase, demanding larger field sizes for efficient production. Moreover, the scanner provides better uniformity and lens distortion in the scanning direction, ensuring consistent image quality across the wafer. But the advantages don't stop there. The scanner's design offers flexibility in the Y direction, allowing for adjustments in focus and overlay corrections. This is crucial as the precision required in semiconductor manufacturing is at a nanometer scale, and even the slightest misalignment can render a chip defective. However, the scanner's design isn't without challenges. One of the primary challenges is ensuring that the mask and wafer move in perfect synchronization. For instance, in a 4x reduction system, the mask has to move four times faster than the wafer. This precise movement ensures that the entire wafer is exposed correctly. Once one section is completed, the wafer shifts to a new position, and the scanning process begins again for the next section. Modern scanners have achieved impressive speeds, with some reaching over 500 mm per second. Achieving such speeds while maintaining nanometer-level positioning accuracy is no small feat. It's a testament to the technological advancements in the field of optical lithography. The progression of optical exposure tools from proximity printing to projection printing, 1x full wafer to reduction step and repeat, and then to step and scan, is given. Today, leading-edge systems come in the step-and-scan configuration, while the step-and-repeat format is used for exposures of non-critical layers in semiconductor processing or for applications such as package, which typically involve large feature sizes. The interplay of resolution, working distance, field size, CD and overlay control, and productivity has changed the configuration of the optical exposure system to the ultimate reduction step-and-scan system in the span of half of a century. In optical lithography, the primary goal is to transfer the pattern from a photomask onto a photoresist using light. However, light, with its wave-like nature, doesn't simply travel in a straight line. When it passes through the photomask, it undergoes diffraction, causing it to spread out over a wide range of angles. If the lens collects all of the diffracted beams, then the grating will be fully reconstructed in the image. However, since the lens collects only a finite number of beams the image is only a partial reconstruction of the original grading pattern. Ernst Abbe, a pioneer in the field of optics, articulated a fundamental principle regarding this. He stated, no microscope permits components to be seen separately if these are so close to each other that even the first light bundle created by diffraction can no longer enter the objective simultaneously with the non-diffracted light cone. To put it in simpler terms, for two closely spaced points on the photomask to be distinctly imaged onto the wafer, the lens must capture not just the direct light but also the first order of diffracted light. This principle is crucial in understanding the results of the experiment we're about to discuss. The video from Trans Light Company demonstrates Abbe's resolution theory using a diffraction grading experiment. A red polarized light source with a wavelength of 632 nanometers illuminates a binary chrome quartz photomask, which has a line and space pattern with a pitch of 7.5 microns. For our imaging analysis, we're focusing on the diffraction orders ranging from minus fourth to plus fourth. On the Fourier plane, where diffraction patterns are directly observable in reciprocal space, the zero spot shines brightly due to the direct transmission of the incident light. 
The plus or minus first and plus or minus third spots are also bright, a result of constructive interference, while the plus or minus second and plus or minus fourth spots appear dimmer due to destructive interference. Moving to the image plane, where the photoresist on the wafer is situated, a clear grating image mirrors the line and space pattern on the photo mask. This image is the result of the interference of the various diffraction orders. The experiment then delves into the role of the aperture in the Fourier plane. By adjusting its size, we can control which diffraction orders reach the wafer. When the aperture size is reduced, higher diffraction orders are blocked, and the resulting image on the wafer changes. For instance, with a smaller aperture, only the zeroth and plus or minus first order diffraction lights form the image, making the grading pattern smoother, yet still discernible. As the aperture size decreases further, the image becomes increasingly blurred, retaining only the pitch periodicity. At the smallest aperture size, only the zeroth light can pass, resulting in a broadened beam image without any discernible grading pattern. No information on the periodicity of the mass pattern is transferred through the projection system. Therefore, the image cannot be considered to be resolved. This experiment underscores two pivotal insights. Firstly, in line with Abbe's theory, for a clear image to form, the projection lens must capture at least the plus or minus first order diffraction, even if it misses higher orders. As patterns shrink, capturing these becomes more challenging due to the wider diffraction angles. Secondly, while an image formed solely from the plus or minus first order is smoother and lacks the clarity of the line and space pattern, this issue can be addressed with the photoresist contrast curve, a topic for our upcoming discussion. On the left side of the slide, you'll see an image of ASML's High Numerical Aperture Immersion ARF scanner. This scanner operates at a specific wavelength of 193 nanometers. The excimer laser source, which is crucial for its operation, is strategically positioned outside the scanner, typically installed beneath the facility floor. Now the condenser or illumination system, positioned on the right and top, plays a pivotal role in transforming the excimer laser output into a uniform illumination of the mask. The projector lens or objective lens, which is a central component of this system, creates an image of the mask right on the wafer's surface. Here's how it works, light from the source is transformed into plane waves that illuminate the mask. Upon interacting with the mask, these waves undergo diffraction. The projector lens then collects a portion of this diffracted light and redirects it towards the image plane, which is precisely positioned close to the photoresist on the wafer's top. A more or less accurate image of the mask is created directly above and inside the photoresist. However, as technology advances and the demand for finer features on the photomask increases, challenges arise. When these features approach the wavelength of light, they cause the light to diffract at much wider angles. This wide-angle diffraction poses a significant challenge for the projection lens. It must capture at least the plus or minus first-order diffraction to form a clear image, as stipulated by Abbe's theory. But as patterns become more refined, even capturing this essential diffraction becomes increasingly challenging due to the broader diffraction angles. The lens, in its attempt to gather all the required light, faces an uphill battle, making the entire process more intricate. Let's delve deeper into the intricacies of optical photolithography, focusing on the pivotal role of the photoresist contrast curve in achieving sharp resist profiles despite diffraction challenges. As previously discussed, the projection lens, due to the limitations set by Abbe's theory, often struggles to capture even the first-order diffraction. This results in an image that, while maintaining the periodicity of the line and space pattern from the mask, exhibits a noticeable decline in its pattern fidelity. At first glance, this degradation might seem concerning, especially when the primary objective of microlithography is to produce well-defined resist features, sized precisely within specifications. The challenge is further compounded when considering the shape of the light intensity distribution produced at the wafer plane by a lens of finite resolution. For lithographers, the task isn't solely about achieving the smallest possible features, it's about ensuring that these features, which are extended geometries on photomasks, are replicated with perfect shape and size control onto the wafer's surface. Lithographers differentiate between two specific terms when discussing intensity distributions. The two-dimensional intensity distribution either above or within the resist is termed the aerial image, signifying the projected invisible image floating in air. 
Conversely, the three-dimensional intensity distribution within the photoresist is known as the bulk image, which bridges optical images with the creation of 3D photoresist profiles. When light projects onto a wafer coated with photoresist through a photomask, an aerial image pattern forms on the photoresist layer. This pattern, due to the inherent wave nature of light and the phenomenon of diffraction, often appears blurred. As device geometries reduce, this diffraction-induced blurriness becomes a significant barrier, challenging the very principles of physics that govern the process. However, the true marvel in this process lies within the properties of the photoresist itself. The photoresist possesses a unique characteristic known as the resist contrast curve. This curve is a graphical representation that plots the relationship between the thickness of the developed resist and the exposure dose for a fixed time. In an ideal scenario, the photoresist remains undeveloped below a certain exposure dose, termed the threshold dose. Beyond this threshold, the photoresist begins to develop, and the previously exposed areas are removed. This threshold dose is crucial because it acts as a delineation point, distinguishing between exposed and unexposed areas of the resist. In real-world applications, this threshold isn't a sharp cutoff but has a range, resulting in a slope curve. This slope, known as the photoresist contrast curve, plays a pivotal role in lithography. It acts as an analog to digital converter, transforming the blurred aerial images into sharp, well-defined bulk images. The steeper this curve, the better the resolution and the more distinct the resulting patterns. In essence, while the aerial image might be blurred due to diffraction effects, the unique properties of the photoresist, especially its contrast curve, ensure that sharp and clear bulk images are formed on the wafer. The final sharp bulk image of the photoresist can be aptly described as a splendid collaboration between the physics of optical lithography and the chemistry of the photoresist. This ability to transform blurred aerial images into precise photoresist profiles is the cornerstone of modern lithography, allowing for the creation of intricate and detailed semiconductor devices. The Rayleigh equation, a hallmark in the semiconductor domain, is more than just a mathematical representation. It embodies the advancements of optical science. Central to this is the Rayleigh criterion, which evaluates the resolution between adjacent patterns. Historically, this measure was pivotal for telescopes, determining the clarity of two closely situated stars. For them to be minimally resolved, one star's airy pattern peak had to align with the first zero of the others, resulting in an overlapping valley intensity of about 26.3% of the peak intensity. In lithography, when the Rayleigh equation is interpreted through Abbe's theory, it considers a diffraction grating defined by equal line and space. This perspective offers a resolution based on half-minimum pitch or CD, correlating directly with K1 and lambda, and inversely with NA. This relationship is encapsulated in the Abbe-Rayleigh criterion, a cornerstone in optical projection lithography. The semiconductor industry's objective is clear, to achieve finer patterns. This translates to a drive to minimize resolution aiming for advanced optical lithography. The Rayleigh equation, while not a direct reflection of semiconductor pattern resolutions, serves as a guiding light and performance benchmark. Innovations have led to the systematic reduction of the light source's wavelength, lambda, with the current pinnacle being the 13.5 nanometers EUV source. The numerical aperture, NA, indicative of a projection lens's capability to capture diffracted light, has reached impressive values. With deep UV sources and glass lenses, we've approached an ANA close to the theoretical maximum of 0.95. Immersion ARF lithography further capitalized on this, using water's refractive index of 1.44 to achieve an NA of 1.35. However, the advent of EUV, with its reflective optics, began with an NA of 0.33, with efforts now directed towards 0.55. The K1, known as the process constant, has a theoretical floor of 0.25 when anchored solely to photolithography illumination. To breach this, techniques like litho-etch litho-etch or sidewall image transfer, integral to multiple patterning technology, are employed. As we delve deeper, our exploration will center on three pivotal areas, the reduction of lambda, the amplification of NA, and the attenuation of K1. Stay tuned as we dissect each dimension to unravel the groundbreaking technologies and their foundational principles. The journey to improve resolution in semiconductor manufacturing has been marked by a relentless drive to reduce the wavelength of light used in optical lithography. 
we started with G line at 436 nanometers, moved to I line at 365 nanometers, and then transitioned to KRF and ARF excimer lasers with wavelengths of 248 nanometers and 193 nanometers, respectively. However, the industry hit a roadblock with F2 lasers at 157 nanometers due to material limitations in optical systems, requiring a shift from fused silica to calcium fluoride lenses. The benefits didn't outweigh the challenges, leading to the abandonment of this wavelength. Soft X-ray was also considered but faced numerous issues, such as the inability to use reduction projection, high mask fabrication complexity, and detrimental effects like shadowing and surface damage. These challenges led to its exclusion from development targets in the industry field. Instead, the industry adopted ARF immersion lithography, elevating the numerical aperture, NA, from 0.93 to 1.35. This approach achieved a resolution comparable to what would have been possible with a 157 nanometers light source. However, the transition to EUV lithography at 13.5 nanometers faced multiple technological barriers, including the development of a powerful tin plasma source, MOSI reflection mirrors, photo mask, and suitable photoresists. It wasn't until 2019 that Samsung first applied EUV in production. As a consequence, it took 12 years from the time ARF immersion was introduced until EUV lithography at 13.5 nanometers was implemented in production by Samsung in 2019. During the 12-year period from the introduction of ARF immersion to the adoption of EUV, the industry faced a significant challenge. The feature sizes of devices continued to shrink, reaching dimensions that were increasingly difficult to achieve with ARF light sources alone. This created a gap in capabilities, where the existing ARF technology was no longer sufficient to meet the demands for finer resolution. To bridge this gap, the industry turned to resolution enhancement technologies based on immersion ARF lithography. By lowering the K1 value to near its theoretical limit of 0.25 for single exposure, advancements were made to keep pace with the shrinking feature sizes. When even lower K1 values were needed, multi-patterning technologies were employed as a workaround. This period of innovation was crucial for maintaining the momentum in semiconductor manufacturing, ensuring that technological progress didn't stall while waiting for the next big leap in lithography, which eventually came with the introduction of EUV. Currently, the industry is working on increasing the numerical aperture in EUV from 0.33 to 0.55. Future research aims to push this even further to 0.75 and explore the possibility of reducing the EUV wavelength to 6.5 nanometers. Let's get right into the topic of increasing the numerical aperture, NA, in optical lithography. The NA is a crucial factor that influences the resolution of the imaging system. It's defined as NA is equal to N times the sine of the theta, wherein is the refractive index and theta is the image side opening angle. The higher the NA, the more details from the original mask layout will appear in the aerial image. This is because lenses with a higher NA can capture a larger amount of diffracted light from the mask, leading to a sharper and higher contrast intensity distribution on the image plane. Now, let's take a historical perspective. The first lithographic steppers used in the late 1970s had an NA of 0.28 and were comprised of about 10 individual lenses. Fast forward to the early 21st century, and we see systems with an NA as high as 0.85, consisting of more than 40 individual lenses. These high NA systems have large incident angles on the lens surfaces, necessitating the development of advanced polishing and coating technologies to minimize issues like scattering and back reflection. It's worth noting that the practical limit for the sign of the opening angle is around 0.93. Increasing the NA isn't a straightforward task. It complicates both the design and manufacturing processes. As you increase the NA, you also have to add more individual lenses to maintain good image quality across the specified image field. Moreover, as we transition from longer wavelengths like G-line and I-line to shorter ones like ARF, the material of the lens has to change from quartz to CF2 due to absorption issues. And when we go even shorter to wavelengths like 13.5 nanometers for EUV, almost all materials become absorptive, requiring a shift from refractive to reflective optics, such as mirror systems. In the case of EUV, the NA has been evolving from 0.25 to 0.33, and now research is underway for high NA of 0.55 and hyper NA up to 0.75. This is a significant leap, but it also brings about its own set of challenges, 
from material changes to design complexities. Immersion lithography, originally inspired by immersion microscopy dating back to the 1840s, has been a cornerstone in semiconductor manufacturing since its introduction in 2007. Remarkably stable in its specifications, the technology has neither seen changes in wavelength nor in its maximum numerical aperture, NA, of 1.35 for over a decade. It has been particularly instrumental in the development of the seven-generation technology nodes, ranging from 45 nanometers to 7 nanometers, especially at a time when 157 nanometers F2 deep UV technology was abandoned and EUV development faced delays. The fundamental principle of immersion lithography is to enhance both resolution and depth of focus by inserting a material with a higher refractive index than air between the projection lens and the wafer. Ultra-pure water, with its nearly ideal optical properties, replaces the air gap, allowing ultraviolet light to pass through and thereby increasing the refractive index, denoted as and to improve overall performance. Various candidates were considered for the immersion liquid, but ultra-pure water emerged as the optimal choice due to its low deep UV absorption rate and excellent chemical compatibility. This water, with a refractive index of 1.44, is confined between the lens and wafer by an immersion hood system. While increasing the fluid index to 1.56 or 1.66 could potentially yield higher NA, it also introduces complications, such as unattainable sign values in the lens. The immersion hood serves as a critical component for supplying, confining, and draining the water during exposure, thereby preventing any leakage. The working distance, defined as the closest distance between the first lens surface and the wafer, is crucial for maintaining a large NA. In immersion systems, this distance is typically reduced to below 3 mm to minimize thermal and inhomogeneity issues. Hydrodynamic and optical considerations dictate that this gap should be kept under 1.2 mm. However, the technology is not without challenges. One significant issue is bubble formation, which occurs due to the lens moving over the wafer at speeds of up to 500 mm per second. These bubbles can scatter photons, thereby affecting the deep UV beam's power and the resulting wafer imprint quality. To counteract this, a degassing process is incorporated into the ultra-pure water generation cycle. Additionally, watermarks left by the lens are minimized using an air knife flow. Another challenge lies in the photoresist material, which can dissolve or bleach when exposed to water. To mitigate this, an immersion top coating is applied to render the photoresist hydrophobic. These top coats can be removed during the development process for added simplicity. While EUV lithography may currently be in the spotlight, 193 nanometers immersion lithography, often referred to as 193I, continues to be an industry mainstay and is expected to remain a key technology for years to come. From 2007 to 2019, the technology node for semiconductor devices shrank from 45 nanometers all the way down to 7 nanometers, covering seven generations. During this time, neither the wavelength nor the ANA could be further improved since the introduction of immersion ARF lithography with a numerical aperture, NA, of 1.35 in 2007. This left the industry with one primary avenue for advancement, reducing the K1 process constant through various resolution enhancement technologies, or RET. To approach the theoretical K1 limit of 0.25, several single patterning techniques were developed and optimized. These encompass advancements in resist contrast, aberrations, and chemistry, as well as innovative techniques in illumination and mask manipulation, sometimes employing a combination of both for optimal results. Each of these technologies contributes to improving the resolution and image quality in its own unique way. For example, OAI alters the angle of incoming light, PSM leverages phase differences to enhance contrast, SMO fine-tunes both the mask and the illumination source, and OPC corrects for distortions that arise due to the proximity of features. As K1 values decrease, new challenges emerge, such as image blurring and reduced contrast for narrower pitch. To address these challenges, pushing the K1 value below 0.25 became the objective by introducing multi-patterning technologies, MPT. These technologies involve multiple rounds of litho-etch processes and employ sidewall image transfer, as seen in double patterning technology, DPT, and quadruple patterning technology, QPT. It's worth noting that the stagnation in wavelength and ENA led to aggressive RET strategies that pushed the K1 factor lower than initially expected. This multifaceted approach ensures that the semiconductor industry continues to push the boundaries of what's technologically possible. However, for this episode, We'll focus solely on single patterning technologies, saving multi-patterning for a separate discussion.
In traditional on-axis illumination, the limitations of resolution become evident when the pitch of the grating is too small. According to Abbe's image formation theory, only a single zeroth order beam is transmitted through the lens, which doesn't allow for a pattern to be imaged onto the wafer. This is where off-axis illumination, OAI, comes into play. OAI allows both the zeroth order light and one first order beam to enter the entrance pupil of the imaging optics. The result is a pattern imaged onto the wafer, overcoming the limitations imposed by diffraction. OAI offers another advantage, it enhances image contrast. By eliminating illumination with small angles of incidence, which only contribute to background light intensity, OAI improves the spatial modulation for very small features. However, it's worth noting that the other first order beam is cut off, resulting in a lower exposing intensity. Depth of focus is another area where OAI shines. The angular spread of light rays in off-axis illumination is less than that in conventional on-axis illumination. This means OAI not only improves resolution but also increases the depth of focus. In terms of the smallest pitch that can be imaged, OAI allows for a K1 value as low as 0.25, which is half the size achievable with on-axis coherent light. Now, let's talk about 2-beam and 3-beam imaging. Techniques that produce 2-beam imaging, like dipole illumination, are generally more effective than those generating 3-beam imaging. Dipole illumination is particularly beneficial because it improves the process window and is most appropriate for imaging vertically or horizontally oriented line space patterns. Standard illuminator shapes also play a role in OAI. Dipole illumination is great for vertical or horizontal lines, while C-quad or cross-quad illumination is ideal for masks with both orientations. Quadruple illumination is best for periodic and orthogonal arrays of square contact holes, and annular illumination is axially symmetric, eliminating any orientation dependency. However, OAI has its limitations. The orientation angles of the poles must follow the orientation of the line space pattern. For instance, tilting the beam in the x-axis won't help resolve spatial frequencies in the y-axis. Additionally, the width of the poles is carefully chosen to avoid lens heating effects and to distribute light smoothly over the numerical aperture. Typically, the source filling ratios are around 20% or larger. The concept of OAI was introduced to microlithography in 1986, motivated by experience in optical microscopy. It was proposed in the early 1990s to supplement or replace phase shifting mask technology and has since become a staple in the fabrication of integrated circuits. Phase shift masks, or PSMs, are a pivotal technology in overcoming the resolution limitations set by diffraction and optical lithography. The core principle of PSMs is to modify both the phase and the transmission of light that goes through the mask features, thereby enhancing the imaging performance. In a standard binary mask or BIM, only the zeroth order of light passes the numerical aperture, NA, of the lens system, resulting in a uniform intensity in the image plane. This is where alternating phase shift masks, or ALT-PSMs, come into play. They alter the phase of every second opening in the mask, effectively doubling the period of the line patterns and having the diffraction angles. This results in the disappearance of the zeroth order light, as the opposite phase from neighboring features cancels it out. Instead, the two first orders of light pass through, creating an interference pattern that sharply defines the line space patterns on the mask. However, it's not all smooth sailing with all PSMs. One significant issue is phase conflicts, which occur when transitioning between two transparent areas with different phase values. This results in an intensity minimum in the aerial image and produces undesired artifacts, such as additional lines connecting the ends of the desired lines. To address this, multiple exposures using trim masks are often employed. These trim masks remove the undesired lines but add complexity and cost to the mask fabrication process. Another alternative to tackle these phase conflicts is the use of chromeless PSMs. These masks have a very small mask error enhancement factor, MEEF, and prevent phase conflicts. However, they come with their own set of challenges. They are difficult to fabricate and inspect because the patterns on the mask are defined by a topography in a single material. This makes it hard to control the etch processes required to create the phase steps, and the masks are also difficult to inspect with tools that rely on different forms of material contrast. In summary, PSMs, particularly ALT-PSMs, offer a way to enhance resolution and improve imaging performance. However, they come with their own set of challenges, such as phase conflicts, that require additional steps like trim masks or alternative approaches like chromeless PSMs to resolve. Phase shift masks, or PSMs, are a pivotal technology in semiconductor fabrication, designed to tackle the resolution limits. 
These masks come in two main types, strong phase shift masks, like alternating PSMs, and weak phase shift masks, known as attenuated PSMs. Strong PSMs, including alternating and chromeless types, offer significant improvements in the manufacturing process. However, they come with their own set of challenges. They're complex to design and inspect, and they also suffer from pronounced mass topography effects. Another downside is that they can't be combined with off-axis illumination technology. When you try to combine an alternating PSM with off-axis illumination, the result is detrimental. The tilted illumination moves one of the diffraction orders out of the pupil, leading to an image without any intensity modulation. Due to these challenges, strong PSMs weren't widely used in volume manufacturing for a long time after their introduction. Switching gears to attenuated PSMs, these are the more flexible and user-friendly option. Unlike their strong counterparts, they're compatible with off-axis illumination, making them versatile in application. They're particularly effective for imaging isolated and semi-dense features. Cost-wise, they're more economical because they require fewer additional processing steps compared to binary masks. One of the most commonly used materials for these masks is MOSI2, which can be fine-tuned to offer both 6% transmission and a 180-degree phase shift. This makes their fabrication process akin to that of binary masks. When used in conjunction with off-axis illumination, they can even expand the process windows of various features. So, in a nutshell, while strong PSMs offer more significant improvements, their complexity and limitations make them less commonly used. On the other hand, attenuated PSMs, with their flexibility and cost-effectiveness, have become a mainstay in modern semiconductor manufacturing. When the K1 value is high, a wide range of features can be captured within a generous exposure defocus, ED, process window. But as K1 decreases, this window narrows, sometimes to the point of vanishing. This narrowing is influenced by how close the features are to other structures on the wafer, and the effect intensifies as K1 continues to drop. Notably, when the size of the feature is less than the wavelength of the imaging light, a variety of proximity effects kick in, including optical, resist, etch, and even full chip level effects. The optical proximity effect, OPE, mainly arises from diffraction, which creates a limited spread in light intensity, affecting nearby features. Factors like the lens's wavelength and numerical aperture, as well as settings on the illuminator such as partial coherence and off-axis illumination, play a significant role. But it's not just about optics, resist processes also amplify these effects. For instance, electron beams can create a spread in the resist that may exceed the beam's own resolution, due to scattering in multiple directions. During the etching and developing stages, openings that are close together consume materials like resist developer or etchants more slowly compared to those spaced farther apart. Additional variables like photoresist and etching introduce more complexity, especially in the areas surrounding the feature being considered. During chemical mechanical polishing, CMP, another factor comes into play, microloading, which is influenced by both chemical depletion and pressure variations due to different pattern densities. Optical proximity correction, OPC, steps in to mitigate these issues. In a narrow sense, it adjusts for errors caused by diffraction, and more broadly, it compensates for process-related effects by modifying the mask. While it's not a true K1 reduction technique like phase shift masks, PSM, or off-axis illumination, OAI, OPC serves as a facilitator for low K1 processes. Even after other K1 reduction methods have been employed, a common ED window might still be lacking. That's where OPC comes in, helping to create this common window, although it doesn't expand individual ED windows. To address the physical changes induced by the optical proximity effect, OPE, optical proximity correction, OPC, employs a variety of techniques. One of the primary challenges is the iso-dense bias, which is the difference in line size between isolated and grouped lines. To mitigate this, specific geometries on the reticle are resized, ensuring that all features are printed at the desired dimensions on the wafers. Additionally, Scattering bars can be used to further reduce iso-dense bias. These bars are carefully designed not to print and are sometimes referred to as assist features or subresolution assist features, SRAF. Another issue is the shortening of line ends, which occurs due to increased light exposure in those areas. This is compounded by the limitations of the optical system, which also result in the rounding of line ends. The area at the end of the line on the wafer is particularly affected, as it receives diffracted light from multiple directions, left, right, and top. To counter these challenges, additional dark regions known as serifs or hammerheads are added to the line ends. But it's not just line ends that are affected, 
corner rounding is another concern. Serifs can be applied to structures beyond just contacts to minimize this effect. Hammerheads serve a dual purpose, compensating for both the shortening of lines and the rounding of corners. By employing these OPC techniques, the physical changes caused by OPE can be effectively managed, ensuring more accurate feature dimensions on the final wafer. Implementing optical proximity corrections, OPC, is a critical component of advanced semiconductor lithography, particularly in the realm of low K1 lithography. While OPC engineering was relatively minimal before the 250 nanometer generation, it has since become one of the most resource-intensive aspects of lithography development, especially by the time we reach the 130 nanometer generation. There are three primary methods for making adjustments to the mask pattern edge, manual OPC, rule-based OPC, and model-based OPC. Firstly, manual OPC is best suited for highly repetitive cells commonly found in memory circuit fabrication. Engineers in this approach manually apply retargets and reshapes to each individual cell. These modifications are subsequently verified through litho simulation for accuracy. Secondly, rule-based OPC was initially designed for 180 nanometer technology and operates based on experimentally determined rules. These rules can vary, covering bias tables for 1D patterns and specific rules like serifs or hammerheads for 2D patterns. Automation is possible in rule-based OPC through design rule checking, DRC, in CAD tools. However, as semiconductor technology advances and feature interactions become more complex, the number of rules required for OPC grows exponentially. This makes rule-based OPC less practical for cutting-edge semiconductor manufacturing. Lastly, model-based OPC has emerged as the standard approach in contemporary semiconductor fabrication. It utilizes highly efficient models for lithographic imaging and resist processing to predict and implement the necessary mask layout corrections. The procedure starts with fragmentation, where the edges of the original mask layout are divided into smaller sections. Each of these sections is then fine-tuned to minimize the discrepancy between the target layout and the actual footprint. This method is comprehensive, incorporating mask models that account for various factors like illumination direction, polarization, and edge orientation, as well as optical models for calculating the aerial image on the wafer. It even includes resist models that simulate the physical processes during exposure and development. While computationally demanding, model-based OPC offers the most thorough approach, taking into account all types of optical, photoresist, and processing effects. Over the past decade, mask pattern correction has transitioned from rule-based OPC to model-based OPC, and even further to dense, pixel-based OPC. In traditional OPC, you start with a known source and mask to predict the image on the wafer. Inverse lithography technology or ILT flips this around. It begins with a known source and wafer image and works backwards to figure out the optimal mask layout. This is an iterative process, with the primary aim being the improvement of the aerial image. The wafer image, which is the desired outcome, can be frozen in the calculations, allowing the mask to be the variable that's adjusted. Advanced optimization techniques are employed to find the most suitable mask layout for a given target. While ILT offers the best theoretical solutions, it's often applied selectively to areas known as hotspots, which are highly susceptible to patterning errors. ILT is also used to generate rules for assist placement. But it's crucial to consider factors like mask data generation time, mask write time with advanced multiple electron beam systems, and photo mask inspection capabilities. Now, Let's move on to source mask co-optimization, or SMO. This technique recognizes that the optimal settings for the source shape and mask geometry are interdependent. Introduced in 2004 by ASML, SMO aims to optimize both the source and the mask in tandem. Traditional disc-shaped illumination sources have evolved into off-axis illuminators like Annular, C-Quad, and Quasar to improve image contrast and the ED process window. However, these were optimized based on fixed mask patterns without considering OPC and sub-resolution assist features. This could result in a source that's optimized for dense patterns but not for varying pitches, which is a problem because the defocus behavior of sparser patterns often limits the process window. The next advancement in illumination technology is freeform illumination. As we push closer to the theoretical limit of K1 equals 0.25, lithography becomes increasingly complex. This puts pressure on the development time for new processes. To meet these demands, diffractive optical elements, or DOE, are used to produce freeform sources. However, DOE comes with its own set of challenges, such as manufacturing lead times, limited storage capacity, and limited tuning capabilities. 
This led to the development of Flex Ray, a fully programmable illuminator that uses the reflection of micro mirror arrays to produce complex optical sources. Lastly, when SMO is combined with ILT, an ILT optimized mask is generated for each designated illumination condition. This hybrid approach has been successfully applied to explore and select lithography processes and design rules for advanced semiconductor technology nodes. Design for manufacturability or DFM is a multidimensional approach that focuses on making semiconductor devices easier to manufacture. It does this by bringing together design and lithography technologies. One big challenge is handling low K1 lithography scenarios. When the K1 value is really low, like below 0.28, Computational lithography and simulation are key tools for optimizing the process. In these tricky low K1 situations, you might think of using dipole illumination. But here's the catch, it only works for lines going in one direction and for very specific pitches. So, one workaround is to change the orientation of all the critical lines on a masking layer. This does make things more complicated because it requires designers and lithographers to work closely together. But the benefits are so good that companies making cutting edge chips all use some form of DFM. Now, let's talk about the tools that make this all possible. Electronic design automation, or EDA tools, are getting better and better at supporting DFM. They now have features like optical proximity correction and manufacturability verification. These tools are crucial for connecting design and lithography, especially when you're dealing with a lot of data and need to process it quickly. They also use advanced methods to make sure the manufacturing process will be as smooth as possible. Switching gears, let's focus on the capabilities of immersion ARF lithography with a numerical aperture of 1.35, using all available resolution enhancement technologies. With a standard illumination system, you can achieve a patterning pitch of around 94 to 96 nanometers. In the context of dense line and space patterns using leaf illumination, the process limitations are quite specific. You're looking at a K1 value of 0.27, a pitch of 76 nanometers, a line edge roughness of 1.8 nanometers, and a depth of focus greater than 120 nanometers, along with an overlay accuracy of 2.5 nanometers. It's crucial to be aware that there are specific forbidden areas where patterning is not possible. These areas occur in the 100 to 170 nanometers pitch range because the process window narrows significantly. This is particularly true at the edges of pattern arrays, where pattern deformation is likely to happen. For patterns that are orthogonal contacts, using negative tone photoresist and annular illumination can get you to a K1 of 0.35 and a 97 nanometers pitch. This is different from the 120 nanometers pitch limit when using the older positive tone photoresist. If the contact layout isn't regular and varies, the limit is a 108 nanometers pitch. The reason this K1 limit is larger than for line and space patterns is because the pitches in different directions vary, making off-axis illumination less effective. Lastly, if you're looking to push these K1 limits even further below 0.25, stay tuned for future episodes where we'll talk about using multiple patterning technology, MPT, and EUV lithography. As of 2023, the semiconductor industry is in a complex state. While EUV 13.5 nanometers and a 0.33 equipment is technically advanced and considered top tier for 300 mm silicon fabs, it's not yet the go-to technology. The high cost of ownership, cost of consumables, and issues like pellicle problems are significant roadblocks. Therefore, EUV is primarily used for critical layers, but for major layers, the industry still relies on immersion ARF or dry ARF systems. For non-critical layers, KRF systems are the standard. The TwinScan NXT 2050i is a high-productivity, dual-stage tool designed for volume production. It stands out with a numerical aperture of 1.35, the highest in the semiconductor industry at the moment. This system is particularly effective for the manufacturing of 300 mm wafers at advanced logic and DRAM nodes. It combines high productivity with exceptional overlay performance, addressing multiple patterning requirements and offering a cost-effective solution. The technical specifications of the NXT 2050i are quite impressive. It operates at a wavelength of 193 nanometers and offers a range of numerical apertures between 0.85 and 1.35. The system is capable of a single exposure resolution of less than or equal to 38 nanometers. The maximum size of the image field is 26 by 33 millimeters. When it comes to single machine overlay, 
the system achieves less than or equal to 1.4 nanometers. In terms of production throughput, it can handle 295 wafers per hour or up to 7,080 wafers per day. Additionally, a new immersion hood minimizes water loss, significantly improving defectivity performance and, consequently, product yield. Optically, the system features a 1.35 and a 193 nanometers catadioptric projection lens capable of achieving production resolutions as low as 38 nanometers. The lens elements come with manipulators to correct for optical aberrations, essential for low K1 imaging. The parallel ILIAS, Paris, sensor enables parallel measurement of optical aberrations, allowing for more accurate alignment and lens heating correction. For imaging performance, the system is compatible with extreme ultraviolet, EUV, and XE systems, achieving a 2.5 nanometers cross matching on product overlay. The reticle stage comes with enhanced clamps for improved reliability and overlay. The Orion alignment sensor offers increased alignment accuracy and is future upgradable to a 12 color mode. The UVLS2 level sensor uses ultraviolet light to minimize sensitivity to process stack variations offering greater leveling accuracy at the wafer edge. In summary, the ASML TwinScan NXT 2050i is a robust and efficient system, particularly for major layers, combining high productivity, state-of-the-art optics, and exceptional imaging performance. Our journey begins with an ARF laser that emits light at a 193 nanometers wavelength. This light is parallel and polarized, making it ideal for the high precision requirements of semiconductor manufacturing. As the laser beam exits its source, it first encounters the bottom module, a complex system designed to shape and guide the beam. Here's how it works. Beam Expander, BXP, the beam is expanded in the X and Y directions without any divergence. Beam Steering Unit, BSU, this unit adjusts the position and direction of the beam, ensuring it's perfectly aligned. Beam Measurement Unit, BMU, this unit measures the X and Y positions and directions of the beam, providing real-time feedback for adjustments. Variable attenuator, VA, this adjusts the intensity of the light, ensuring it's neither too weak nor too strong for the photolithographic process. Automatic DOE exchanger, this allows for the selection of a specific diffractive optical element, DOE, based on the requirements of the task at hand. Zoom axicon, ZA, this changes the annularity of the beam, another factor in the beam's final shape. Energy sensor, ES, this is the final check on the beam's intensity before it moves on to the top module. After the bottom module, the beam moves on to the top module for further refinement. Integrator rod, IR, this improves the uniformity of the beam, a crucial factor for the lithographic process. Reticle masking, RIMA blade, this determines the size of the beam, ensuring that the area outside of the printed area of the reticle can be masked off. Reticle masking, RIMA, lens, this determines focus it uniformly, ensuring that the light is evenly distributed. Uniformity correction module, Unicom, filter, this module fine-tunes the uniformity of the beam in the slit direction. All these steps are designed to ensure that the beam, when it finally reaches the reticle, has uniform and sufficient intensity. This is critical because poor uniformity can lead to CD variation, bad telecentricity can result in XY displacement affecting overlay and focus, and low intensity can extend the exposure time, slowing down the entire process. So there you have it, a comprehensive look at how a simple beam of light is meticulously transformed into a specialized tool for photolithography, thanks to the intricate workings of the illumination system. He shift from mercury arc lamps to KRF excimer lasers was a transformative development in the field of deep UV lithography. Mercury lamps face challenges due to their low optical efficiency, making it difficult to generate the required exposure power. When operating around the 250 nanometers wavelength, the choice of optical materials becomes extremely limited. Fused silica is essentially the only option for imaging lenses, which means chromatic aberration cannot be corrected. This limitation makes the use of a laser source indispensable. Among lasers, excimer lasers stand out for their high efficiency and lower spatial coherence, effectively mitigating the speckle issue that is problematic in microlithography. Simmer Company has innovated in this space with their two-chamber laser system, known as the Master Oscillator Power Amplifier, MOPA, 
which produces light with even less spatial coherence than what is typical for injection locking lasers. 1. Master Oscillator, MO, Chamber In the Master Oscillator, MO, Chamber, the core component of microlithography-related excimer lasers, the laser is pumped using electric discharge. This discharge forms KRF excited dimers or excimers, which are excited molecules essential for lasing. The electric discharge is generated by applying a high voltage across a gas mixture containing krypton, Kr, fluorine, F2, and neon, Ne. This process occurs at an impressive rate of 6,000 times per second, enabling the laser to operate at 6 kHz. Once the KRF excimers are formed, several processes take place, spontaneous emission, stimulated emission, and quenching. These processes are crucial for the amplification of light within the laser. However, the excitation rate faces challenges from fast loss processes, such as collisions and spontaneous decay. These processes can deactivate the KRF excimers in a matter of nanoseconds, making it essential to maintain high pump power densities exceeding 1 MW per cubic centimeter for effective lasing. The laser produces light in pulses, and modern KRF and ARF excimer lasers are capable of pulsing at rates up to several kilohertz. Operating at such high frequencies allows the laser to deliver high doses of light in short periods, reducing the risk of damage to optical elements without requiring high peak light intensities. 2. Line Narrow Module, LNM After the MO chamber, the light is directed to the LNM. Here, the bandwidth of the light is meticulously narrowed. The natural bandwidth of freely running KRF lasers is around 300 picometers in full width half maximum, FWHM. However, this is too broad for high-resolution wafer steppers. The LNM filters and conditions the light to achieve a much narrower bandwidth, as small as 3 picometers FWHM, which is crucial for reducing chromatic aberration in lithography. 3. Power Ring Amplifier, PA, Chamber The light then enters the PA chamber, where the generated pulse is amplified to a level that is 10 to 20 times higher in energy. While excimer lasers for advanced lithography can reach output powers as high as 120 watts, in practice, somewhat lower powers like 60 to 90 watts are used to maintain the exceedingly tight bandwidth requirements of leading-edge optical lithography. 4. Optical Pulse Stretcher, OPUS The final stage is the OPUS, which stretches the beam duration from its original pulse length of 25 to 30 nanoseconds. This stretching is essential as it reduces the peak energy while maintaining the total integrated energy, minimizing the potential for damage to optical elements. 5. Additional Modules Line Center Analysis Module, LCAM, measures the wavelength of light and the amount of energy, ensuring that the laser is operating within the desired parameters. Bandwidth Analysis Module, BAM, works to stabilize the light, ensuring that the bandwidth remains within the desired narrow range. The SimmerMOPA system is designed for longevity, capable of delivering up to 20 billion pulses in its lifetime. Key maintenance tasks include cleaning the fluorine, F2, trap after several hundred gas fills and the output coupler after 7 billion pulses. The system also undergoes monthly fine-tuning to correct wavelength drift and restore energy stability. These measures ensure the system meets the rigorous demands of advanced lithography, making it a reliable asset in semiconductor manufacturing. In this presentation, we'll explore the evolving landscape of lithography illumination technology, focusing on the increasing demand for freeform sources, the traditional role of diffractive optical elements, DOE, and the revolutionary flex ray system. Starting with illumination shape, it's a critical component in lithography, alongside the radiation wavelength and the numerical aperture of the projection lens. The rise of source mass co-optimization techniques has amplified the need for freeform sources, pushing traditional methods like off-axis and multipole illumination to their limits. This has led to a pressing demand for freeform sources that can quickly adapt to new shapes for both R&D and production. Freeform illumination offers unparalleled customization, allowing for a fully customizable light intensity map. This liberates the source from the constraints of geometric shapes, providing the flexibility essential for contemporary lithography. Turning to DOE, these are specialized physical elements often made from customized etched glass. 
They are strategically placed between the laser and the optical system to create the desired light source. While DOE can generate a variety of source shapes, each new shape usually necessitates a new dough, which can be both time-consuming and costly. Moreover, DOE has limitations, such as the lead time for developing a new source and the limited number of different sources that can be stored in the DOE exchanger. Enter FlexRay, a groundbreaking technology designed to overcome these limitations. FlexRay features a Micro Mirror Array, MMA, with 4,096 micro mirrors, each capable of tilting in two directions. Controlled by an ASIC chip, these mirrors can create a wide array of source shapes in minutes, offering unparalleled versatility and speed. This technology is even being applied to EUV reflective optical systems as a full flex illuminator. In FlexRay, each micro mirror reflects a 193 nanometers light spot in the pupil plane. Changing the mirror angles alters these spots, thus changing the source shape. Importantly, all mirrors are always in use, ensuring no light loss when switching between source shapes. The MMA is housed in a dedicated assembly designed for easy mounting. The mirrors are coated with a highly reflective material to maximize the use of ARF photons. Flex Ray's durability is also impressive, designed to withstand up to 40 million movements over 7 years of continuous use. The advantages of Flex Ray are manifold. It eliminates the constraints and costs associated with DOE, offers consistent performance across different scanners, and significantly reduces the time required for source changes. In conclusion, Flex Ray stands as a versatile, efficient, and reliable solution for modern lithography, setting a new standard in the field. Continuing on with our discussion on lithography technologies, let's delve into the topic of improving critical dimension, CD. Uniformity in lithography. Specifically, we'll focus on ASML's dose mapper technology, which incorporates both Unicom and Dosicom modules for comprehensive control. Dose mapper is a technology from ASML designed to optimize CD uniformity by adjusting the exposure dose. It aims to improve both across chip line width variation (ACLV) and across wafer line width variation (AWLV). In simpler terms. It adjusts the exposure dose to improve the uniformity of the line width both within a chip and across the entire wafer. The technology exercises two degrees of control, Unicom XL for the slit direction and Osicom for the scan direction. These modules work in tandem within the dose mapper system to provide a holistic approach to dose correction. It's important to note that the line width has a nearly linear relationship with the exposure dose, making dose sensitivity a key factor in this process. Now, Let's talk about UNICOM, which stands for Uniformity Correction Module. This technology focuses on the slit direction and changes the intensity profile across it. The actuator for this is a variable profile gray filter, and it has a maximum correction range of plus or minus 5%. UNICOM XL, a more advanced version, uses 29 upper and 29 lower fingers to adjust the energy distribution, thereby improving slit uniformity. These fingers are inserted into the illumination beam to locally trim the intensity. The effective finger width is 4 mm at the reticle level. Unicom modules consist of light-absorbing elements that are adjustable in the scanning direction to set the outer boundary of the illumination slit. These elements are often made of transmissive quartz plates coated with a semi-transparent layer. However, one drawback is that refraction occurs at the air quartz interface, leading to issues like ellipticity, telecentricity, local stray light, or hotspot errors. Lastly, we have Dosicom, which is designed to change the intensity profile along the scan direction. Unlike Unicom, which focuses on the slit direction, Dosicom aims to make high-order corrections to the dose profile along the scan direction. This is particularly useful for achieving more complex and precise dose distributions. In summary, Dose Mapper integrates both Unicom and Dosicom modules to offer a comprehensive solution for improving CD uniformity. It provides precise control over the exposure dose and enables adjustments in both the slit and scan directions, making it a robust tool for modern lithography systems. Let's dive deeper into the role of projection lenses in lithography, focusing on how high end lenses have become a cornerstone for improving resolution. These lenses are responsible for projecting the reticle pattern onto the wafer usually at a 4 to 1 reduction ratio. Initially, stepper lenses were the industry standard, 
but they had their limitations. These lenses used a square field, which necessitated large-sized lenses, thereby capping the N value at around 0.5. However, the transition from stepper to scanner systems was a game-changer. Scanner systems employ a slit field, allowing for smaller lens sizes and, consequently, the possibility of achieving higher N values. According to ASML and Zeiss, Canon, and Nikon, the same all-refractive lens technology used for wafer stepping was well-suited for step and scan lithography. In fact, a refractive stepper lens with its circular image field can scan an image field nearly 30% larger in height than the inscribed square. This is a significant advantage as it allows for larger image fields to be exposed by smaller lenses, or same-sized lenses of higher numerical aperture. One of the most significant benefits of using a slit field in scanner systems is that you can rotate the lens to select the area with the least aberration. This optimizes image quality, a feature not possible with the older stepper systems. The evolution of light sources has also had a profound impact on lens technology. Initially, mercury lamps were the standard. However, the transition to excimer lasers necessitated a change in lens materials, photoresist materials, and even the chemistry and processes involved. For instance, when the wavelength changed from 365 nanometers in the stepper lens of 1993 to 248 nanometers in the scanner lens of 1999, it eliminated the need to color correct the lens. The narrow bandwidth of the KRF excimer laser allowed all elements of the lens to be made from fused silica, an optimized material for the ultraviolet spectrum. When the light source further evolved from KRF to ARF lasers, the ANA saw a huge increase from 0.68 to 0.85. This was achieved with a relatively small increase in physical size, thanks to the introduction of large departure aspheric surfaces into the lens design. This change substantially altered the optical design form from its predecessors. The introduction of immersion lithography marked another pivotal moment, shifting from dioptric to catadioptric lens systems. Dioptric lenses, which rely solely on refraction, were found to be impractical for achieving higher NA. Catadioptric lenses, combining both refraction and reflection, proved to be more efficient in maintaining a flat image field while controlling size and cost. These lenses are complex to design due to the multiple mirror surfaces, but they offer a more relaxed and efficient design, distributing ray bending smoothly among the many optical surfaces in a lens system. In terms of lens materials, fused silica was initially the only viable option. However, with the advent of ARF lithography, crystalline CIA F2 became available. This material can work down to 157 nanometers and even shorter wavelengths. Lenses for 193 nanometer ARF lithography typically use both fused silica and a small quantity of CIA F2 to meet the narrow bandwidth requirements. Finally, let's look at a specific example, ASML's 1950i catadioptric lens with an NA of 1.35. This lens is an engineering marvel, consisting of various elements like NEXE, SSI, and MALE, among others. These elements work in harmony to maximize resolution and minimize aberrations, offering unprecedented control and adaptability. In summary, the evolution of projection lenses in lithography has been a journey of continuous adaptation and innovation, responding to changes in light sources, materials, and even the fundamental principles of lens design to push the boundaries of resolution enhancement. As we wrap up our comprehensive look at lithography, let's quickly summarize the key points. We've traced the history of lithography from its early days of contact and proximity printing to the more advanced projection printing methods, including 4X reduction, steppers, and scanners. We delved into the imaging theory, discussing a based diffraction grading demonstration, the challenges posed by diffraction, and the role of photoresist contrast curves. We also explored various resolution enhancement technologies based on Rayleigh equation that have evolved over time. These include wavelength reduction from G-line to the cutting-edge EUV, and an enhancement through immersion lithography, and K1 reduction techniques like off-axis illumination and phase shift masks. We also touched on sophisticated methods like optical proximity correction and source mask co-optimization. We took a closer look at ASML's lithography tools, particularly the NXT 2050i, 
and discussed its beam pathway, excimer laser technology, and beam shaping methods like diffractive optical elements and flex. Ray. We also covered the role of dose mapper, unicom, and dosicom in dose control and uniformity. Lastly, we examined the different types of projection lenses used, including dioptric and catadioptric lenses. So, from its historical roots to the latest advancements in technology and tools, lithography has come a long way and continues to be a cornerstone in the semiconductor manufacturing process. That was a lot to cover, right? Today we went through some complex topics, focusing on the science and technology behind lithography imaging. It might have been a bit technical, but we hope it helped you understand this important part of semiconductor manufacturing. Thanks for sticking with us as we go through the ins and outs of photolithography technologies. We have more to explore, and we'll continue to dive into these topics in future episodes. If you found this episode helpful, please consider liking the video, subscribing to our channel, and turning on notifications so you won't miss our upcoming content. Your continued interest is what keeps us going. Stay with Semi-Slides as we keep exploring the world of semiconductor technology. We look forward to bringing you more in-depth content in our next episode.